Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to session. This is uh, session seven of our generative AI and AI info series. I'm Lisa Burgess. I am assistant director at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I am joined by Deb Breen, director of uh, the Center of the T of Teaching and Learning. Uh, Cindy Vincent in communications and marketing here at DLNI, and Sam or Chris, who's who is managing our slideshow today. Today we're going to be talking about student use of generative AI in the classroom. We have three very creative faculty with us, uh, two faculty and a PhD student with us today that have come up with some very interesting and creative ways to use generative AI with students in the classroom. Sam? We are recording today's session. Um, and the info, once this info session has been recorded, it'll then be available um, at the um, uh, on our website later later this month once it's published. Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's session. So this session, like our previous ones, uses the Q and A feature. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see the share screen and the pop. Uh, maybe pause and stop recording, I see that. But then you'll see a Q&A button. Um, to engage with our participants and speakers today, go ahead and select that Q&A button whenever you feel like submitting a question throughout today's session. After all of our speakers speak, we will have a moderated Q&A time block in which um, your questions will, will be asked to each of the participants. However, what's different with this is in the Q&A feature itself, you can upvote um, any of the questions that you particularly want to make sure get asked to our participants today. Um, usually, you know, questions trickle in kind of slowly, and then during the Q&A, they come in more rapidly. So to ensure that your question is heard or other questions that you find interesting are heard, be sure to, to hit that button that looks like a thumbs up or a little like button, and that will filter your question up to the top of the Q&A box that I will be asking each of the participants later in today's session. Thank you. So today we're going to be hearing from Associate Professor Kevin Gold, who is working with students. He developed a uh, tutor bot in his classroom for his homework assignments, and he's been uh, working on that for a, just about a year now, I believe. Uh, we also have Amber Navarre, a master lecturer in the world languages and literature um, over at CAS, and she works with students uh, using generative AI in language courses. We have Dong Peng Wang who is a PhD student in the College of Communications, and she is doing a research study on student use of generative AI individually versus in group settings. And she, um, I've actually had the privilege of working with Dong Peng over the past year on her project a little bit, uh, and it's really quite interesting. She's done some very fascinating work. So I'd like to start, uh, Kevin, if you would like to um, introduce your project and tell us how students are, are working uh, with your chatbot. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm an instructor for uh, DS110, which is Introduction to Data Science with Python. And a big focus of the course is getting students to um, learn uh, Python programming and programming in general. Um, next slide. Uh, but there is a, a big challenge uh, here with the introduction of generative AI, which is that uh, for programming especially, uh, generative AI can produce pretty reasonable output uh, for students who just want to dump their um, problem descriptions into ChatGPT and get uh, answers back out. Um, and so I have an example of this on the right where, you know, you can just sort of dump in the whole problem. It doesn't matter that it has the extra, you know, seven points or whatever in the text. Um, you know, uh, here's the programming problem. This is a problem from like a, you know, week one or week two of the course. And, uh, you know, uh, ChatGPT will say, all right, you know, here you go, you know, you're done. Um, and so uh, this really creates a situation in the course that is uh, untenable in the long term, because uh, you know a lot of students uh, avoid using generative AI in this way because they want to learn the material themselves. Uh, but it feels bad to have a classroom in which you know students are using the AI and then getting better homework scores than the uh, students who are refusing to use it. Um, and uh, so uh, and and um, we can't sort of have a hard line against it either, because um, especially in the case of code, uh, no good tools exist for um, identifying uh, the output of um, ChatGPT versus human output. 
if you're if you're an instructor, you can have a pretty good idea as to what is really unlikely um, for students to uh, produce. And so in this, you know, early problem here uh, where it's, you know, week one or week two of the course, probably the student who's doing the assignment is not raising value error as they do on the third line of uh, this example. Um, and so an instructor can kind of look at this and sort of tell. Um, but um, without automated programs, it's, it, it'd be a sort of like, you know, uphill struggle uh, to kind of um, have a hard line against uh, generative AI in the classroom. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so um, what if we reimagine what homework is like then in the world of uh, generative AI? What if it's not so much about evaluation and is instead a kind of learning playground where students can get arbitrary amounts of help um, but uh, we're not just going to sort of give them the solutions. We're going to force them to think about the steps that they're employing and kind of uh, have an interaction that's more like one with a, um, a TA. Um, so uh, this is the shift that I've tried to make in the um, course. And um, it only works if you also kind of have some kind of evaluation that you trust. So we've also moved to, you know, in-class exams. But um, I've created a sort of uh, bot that, um, you know, it's it's not actually a sort of entity unto itself. It's more like a man in the middle uh, that talks to GPT-4, where the student will enter a query, and then we'll sort of like take that query and package it and say to GPT-4, you're a teaching assistant in this course, um, and the student wants help. You do want the help to help them. Your primary goal is to help the students learn. Um, but you're going to not tell them directly the answer to uh, this problem. You're going to reply in the form of a question that is designed to lead them uh, toward the solution, uh, which is a kind of like classic approach in uh, how TAs should handle office hours called the Socratic approach, um, where, uh, you know, you sort of like make sure that the student is on board and learning things and not, you're not just sort of telling them answers uh, by engaging in this uh, sort of practice. So we offer this kind of um, trade uh, where the students... Um, can interact with this bot, and the bot is told ahead of time what the uh, homework and solutions are, um, and so the student can easily say something like, uh, I'm confused about problem 2B or something like that, and the bot knows what um, uh, it, the student's asking about. And it's a better version of uh, GPT than what the student would normally have access to because it's GPT-4 instead of uh, chat GPT. And we told the bot the answer. So these are all things that make it more attractive than just going to chat GPT and getting the answer. But the one stipulation is, we're not going to just spit out the answers. We're going to make the student work for it with this Socratic method kind of thing. Um, and so hopefully that's like a better deal for the student. The, the student is still assured that in the end, they can get a good sort of score on this homework if they sort of play the game with the bot long enough. But they're going to hopefully learn something along the way um, this way uh, rather than just kind of getting the um, ChatGPT uh, output. Uh, next slide. And so here's an example of an interaction with, that's pulled from the logs. So this is a real interaction, not kind of like sort of conceptually what it might say, but what it actually did say in one case. So the student uh, says for the homework, what's the answer to 1A? Uh, AI, I'm sorry, but it would, wouldn't be appropriate for me to give you the answer outright. Uh, and that's our instructions to not give the answer at work. Uh, however, I can guide you on how to solve it. Have you tried using a loop to iterate through each item on the receipt and comparing the prices? Um, and then the student says, well, how do I iterate? What does that even mean? Um, yeah, in Python, you can use a for loop to iterate through a list. Uh, you know how to set up a for loop to iterate through the tuples? Student, no, um, no problem. And so like, this is great, right? We have taken an interaction that would have just been a sort of answer dump if the uh, student had asked ChatGPT about it and turned it into like an opportunity for the student to actually learn the material. Um, and the student's like on board because like, they, they want both. They want a good score and they want to learn. Uh, and so like that's the sort of you know deal that we sort of offer. Next slide. Um, so uh, these are some of the results that we've had from uh, polling the students about uh, the interactions. Um, fully uh, two thirds of the students seem to be using the bot in the um, uh, last semester in the fall. And uh, of those, you can see on the left, um, the majority of them were uh, rating the bot as uh, very helpful for their learning or somewhat helpful for their learning in uh, a poll. Um, and we also did some uh, sort of independent rating to make sure that the answers were actually helpful as opposed to just seeming to the students to be helpful. And the uh, answers were often deemed to be um, helpful. And then on the right, we have a sort of uh, you know comparison uh, for the answer to the question, you know, does this resource help you learn the material? Um, and you can see that the tutor bot over there um, 
is very favorable uh, with respect to like um, uh, teaching assistant office hours. You have there a uh, 4.0 average as opposed to 4.2 on a five point scale for um, how you know helpful the bot is uh, deemed to be, and um, doing rather better than sort of classic delivery material uh, uh, delivery like um, the textbook. Um, which, you know, I guess the students don't really like the textbook anyway, but it gives you a sense of like, you know, how it fares against traditional materials um, or uh, or even the lecture itself, which is kind of the gold standard for what the material is. Um, students prefer this kind of interactive you know, way of getting at the material rather than uh, just having it uh, delivered in lecture format. Next slide. Uh, and so um, where are we now? Well, the, the bot still um, is not great at re realizing like sort of like um, when it's leaking too much information. Um, it does pretty well without any additional safeguards. Uh, we had a sort of uh, zero to three leak scale and uh, the average was a one for most of the materials for like how leaky of the answer the, the bot was. Um, but still certain kinds of queries will get it to basically like spell out um, the, all the steps that are necessary for a problem where that may have been something we wanted the student to think about themselves a little bit more. So we're kind of working through um, that issue and currently dealing with a kind of like um, format for uh, generative AI where if you have it generate a tentative solution and then you say, stop, like think about this whole interaction. Are you leaking too much of the solution? Um, so we're experimenting with that kind of stuff. Uh, but then moving forward, it would be nice to have this kind of uh, extended to the promise of sort of infinite um, practice problems for students, um, where it's not just helping them with the homework, but it's helping them with um, problems that it comes up with uh, itself, maybe sort of tailored to the students' requests for what they want to practice um, in, in uh, preparation for the exams and so forth. Um, so uh, it'd be nice to sort of in the, in the uh, nearish future also provide sort of a source of um, practice problems for exams. Um, are also thinking of like packaging this up so that somebody who doesn't know Python could use the system because it's very like material agnostic. There's nothing in the sort of programming of it um, that uh, says that it has to be about data science or programming. Um, and then, you know, ideally, like kind of like change the world of, uh, you know, the homework for the students in this course, at least to be uh, more of this kind of experience of like having a sort of, um, you know, tutor uh, ever, ever present. So um, I'm optimistic that we can kind of like create uh, sort of more engaging uh, experiences to, for students that you know leverage these uh, generative AI things that aren't just about the homework help, but kind of about sort of like creating that whole at-home learning experience and trying to help students with that. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That's really exciting. Um, I spoke with you last year, and so you've really, really done a lot of work on this. It's 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 turning out great. Well, thank you. Uh, next slide. Next, we're going to hear from Amber Navarre, Master Lecturer at the College of Arts and Sciences in World Languages and Literature, and she is using AI to help students in uh, foreign language courses. Hello, everyone. I'm Amber. So uh, I teach Chinese. So most of it is from my experience playing with AI tools with my uh, Chinese classes. So next slide. So we're talking about students' use of AI in language classes. So from some of them, well, I did everything and some of them uh, are shared with my colleagues. They also do a lot of things in language classrooms. So the range of students' use of AI in language class classes range from they would use it to edit their writing and revision and look looking up information like cultural information, traditions in that culture, history, celebrities. They also do interactive reading, which is interesting. Uh, an example of interactive reading is you can feed ChatGPT a scenario like I could not find my dog this morning. Of course, in my class, that would be in Chinese. And then ChatGPT will give you several options and the story just unfolds this way. And they can also use ChatGPT to have a chat and interview with them. Next slide, please. So today I would specifically want to talk about this new experiment this semester that is to use a chat bot in LC211, which is the third semester Chinese. So students already have some command of that language, but not high up in their proficiency. So in order to do that, I want the chatbot to feel like as if students are talking with a real human. So it's as much as can be. Okay, so the first step is to, to create this character that is going to talk, chat with them. 
So we use the one of the textbook characters. So as you see in this image, we have five main characters in this textbook series. So to develop this character with AI, I first I uploaded all the text in the textbook into uh, GPT 4.0. So uh, 4.0 allows you to upload uh, text like Word document or PDFs. So I've uploaded all of them and I asked it to analyze and give me one paragraph description of the first char character you see here, Tian Ming. So Tian Ming is the person I want the chatbot to present itself as. So after it gives me the one paragraph description. So when you have that, there are actually three ways to create this kind of conversation between students and that character. First, you can just give students this paragraph as prompt, and they can just give it to ChatGPT themselves and ask ChatGPT to, to interact with them as this character. I didn't go with that method because it doesn't feel like they're talking to a real person, and also they have seen all the information about this person in that paragraph. I didn't go with that. Two, if you know coding, if you know programming language, you can use API to create a chatbot yourself. I don't know anything about coding, so I didn't go with that method either. So the third way is what I actually did. I found this website, character.ai. So if you guys are interested in opening it, you uh, this is open to everyone. So once you're on this website, you, can, you actually see a lot of already developed characters. Most of them are from fantasy novels, video games, and manga. So it's very uh, fantasy-oriented site. And those are already developed. The good thing about this website is that you can create your own characters. And you can also keep it private. So I keep it private so only me and the students who I share the link with can chat with this bot I created. So what happened on the, that website is I uploaded the description I just created with ChatGPT. And the, it's in the background so students don't see this part. And it creates this character uh, based on the description I gave the character.ai website. And then I have to give a greeting line to it. That is, hello, my name is Tian Ming. What would you like to ask me? Of course, in Chinese. And then I just send students the link and they can just chat with Tian Ming. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the chat. So the first line you see is, hello, I'm Tian Ming. What question would you like to ask me, etc." So you can chat with it about just anything. So next slide. So here's my students' interaction. So after this experiment, I had students tell me two things. So one, what, what do they talk about? What did they learn about Tian Ming from this chat? And two, the reflection of this activity itself. So their interaction with Tian Ming, some of the, uh, the interaction focuses on the information I gave, I fed this uh, AI tool. So they talk about how old he is, his birthplace, hobbies, food preference, preferences, school relationship with the other characters in the book. So pretty much focus on the, the things that the textbook covers. But they also ask questions beyond the information I fed AI. So that part, AI will have to create its own reactions to their questions. So they talked about uh, his favorite band, the pets that he has, and how he feels about Boston, et cetera. And one specifically interesting uh, interaction is this student told Tian Ming, no, you're actually an Irish sleeper agent. And Tian Ming just went along with that and said, yes, my name is actually Rosie McDonald O'Toole's and I live in Dublin. And their conversation went on based on this. So next slide. And students' reaction to this activity is overwhelmingly positive. So 19 out of 20 participating students reacted very, very well to this. The only one who didn't give positive feedback, he also didn't hate it. It's like more neutral view of this. So among the positive reactions, 
So the most commonly mentioned thing is that it helps me practice the language and it is interesting, it is cool, it is fun. The next three are actually what I see the most valuable contribution that this activity gives to a language class student. So the first one is it's helpful because I can't find anyone, I can't find somebody to practice with me in real life. So depending on which language you teach, it could be the case that they can't find any native speakers or any speakers of that language in their real life. So that's when this AI chatbot comes into comes in to become very helpful for them. And a student said, it is as if I was talking to someone my age. This is also very important because in the language classroom, most of the language input comes from the teacher. And the teacher as a like 40 some year old person, we don't always talk about the same topics as the college students their age. So since the setting of this character is a college student, it feels as if they are talking with someone their age. So the uh, next thing is that it feels less stressful than talking to a real native speaker. So even and if you're teaching a language where students can find speakers to communicate with them in real life, in their real life, they might feel too intimidate, intimidated to do so. So talking with AI is like a preparatory step towards that so that they can practice it in a less stressful environment. Next slide, please. Some students also mentioned that they wish this, um, this chatbot could do this or that. And uh, first thing is, I wish Kiming would ask me questions too. And I wish he would give more details to his answers. And the third one is also interesting. This student wants more structured practice from me, from the instruction for this activity, because he felt it is too open-ended and he's not sure what to ask. But if you look at these three comments, they are exactly a proof that this conversation with AI is very similar to real life conversations. Because in real life conversations, sometimes, the when the communication goes one way you would want to ask the other person to ask you questions so i have a i have a chat with my students after that ask them okay what would you do if it happens in real life when you have a real conversation in chinese with someone else and the students just say hmm i might just ask do you have any questions for me and I say, well, you can ask the chat about that question too. Do you have any questions for me? And next time, the next round, he did do that and he was happy about how it turned out. So the second thing also, if you want a real person to give you more details to their answers, just ask as if you're talking to a real person. And the third one is, well, in real life, you don't have a conversation in like a structured practice to to simulate real life conversation you don't you don't have an agenda or anything usually when you're chatting with just a friend next to you so it is going to be open to just find something to chat with them the fourth thing is what this tool hasn't been able to do is it doesn't have a voice which means the uh, text to speech effect on this side it doesn't work with chinese yet last time i checked it works with ChatGPT4, but I wouldn't recommend that because when I tested it, the, the voice sounds still too robotic. So it kind of takes away the feeling that you're talking to a real person. So those are the students' wishes. And it's just a very interesting experiment. And we already did the second round after this experiment and students were, are still reacting very positively to this. So I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. That sounds like a really interesting uh, platform to work with. Next slide, Sam. Next, we're going to hear from Dongfeng Huang. She's a PhD student at the College of Communications and Emerging Media Studies. And she worked with her students in a research methods course. Am I correct, Dongfeng, research methods? Uh, yep. Of course, in yep, uh, in using generative AI in individual settings as well as in collaborative settings. Okay. Um, 
Next slide, please. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dong Peng Huang. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Emerging Media Studies program at College Communication. Um, this is a study I've been working on with my colleagues, Dr. James J. Cummings and Nicole Yixuan Huang. This study was supported by Boston University's Accelerating Classroom Transformation Grants. And thank you, Lisa, very much for your help throughout the entire process. Next slide, please. Um, yep, can you show the picture as well? Yep, thank you. So um, the study was conducted uh, last fall semester in my class. And of course, uh, CM321, uh, undergrad level course that I instructed um, about uh, teaching the students how to do communication research method, including survey, experiment, um, focus group, interview. Uh, apart from the theoretical part, I also teach data analysis. So they need to do um, a group research project that they propose a study and go out to collect empirical data and analyze the results and do the presentation. So this is a distribution of the class grades. So you say there are four assessments, um, which I will tell, uh, explain more details later. Um, that would be uh, information recall questions followed with chat GPT uh, report and also group research project uh, that is divided into different research groups to work on the project as they propose. And all of the assignment, I highly encourage them to use chat GPT to help them throughout the process, but also report everything that they've been used. Uh, and my grant covered their uh, license phase so that they can have access to the most advanced models. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here I will uh, explain what the task looks like in my class. So the first type is individual assessment. They will be uh, conducted in class uh, with a 45 time limits via Blackboard. Uh, each assessment consists with about 20 to 25 questions on the um, course content that I teach. They can take notes while the class and uh, the assessment are open everything. So they can refer to their notes, their uh, textbook, internet, search engine, chat GPT. Um, but if they use chat GPT during the assessment, uh, they should do a report of their usage. So report includes that uh, indicate which question that you use ChatGPT to help you. What is a prompt that you ask ChatGPT? What is a question you ask? Um, what is the answer you got? If the answer is correct, uh, if you accept the answers, if you uh, try uh, multiple times to gain more information. Group research projects are, um, they first need to bring up with a research idea and then uh, write up a proposal. Then they're gonna go out and collect empirical data and analyze the data. So it be um, consists of two parts. I don't have a limitation on how they should use ChatGPT in their group collaboration. Uh, so there'll be free exploring everything, the plugins, uh, the functions, um, everything that they might feel helpful. Um, but they also need to report the usage for either for both the proposal write up and also um, the data analysis part. So they'll be uh, explaining what kind of services do you need? Uh, do you use ChatGPT? Like I use ChatGPT to. Um, brainstorm ideas, research ideas. Um, yeah, they have to explain the rationale for the usage so that, so for example, they say, I like, we generally know what we want to do, but we want to narrow down um, the research scope and we want to brainstorm some ideas. Um, so we use ChatGPT to help us uh, really settle down on a 
project that we can work on. Um, original work, some of them use ChatGPT to revise their survey questionnaire. So I want uh, I let them to uh, to report what their original survey questionnaire is, and what is the revised one that they um, that they have based on the suggestions um, given by ChatGPT. Um, and also, uh, yes, and how their information is utilized. If you're just taking the the answers. Um, given by ChatGPT or you uh, work with your, your teammates, discuss and revise um, any plugin that you use. And uh, issues especially comes with the data analysis. So majority of my students do not have prior experiences with data analysis. So they basically learn everything from scratch in my class. Um, they have a lot of issues with understanding the statistic at first and then understanding softwares. So I teach them using both SPSS and R for data analysis. And they can gain help from like writing an R code and what, what are the steps that I should do in SPSS to, to, to have like descriptive statistics. And um, they, 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 they gonna report if that issues was addressed, uh, was solved by ChatGPT. Next slide, please. So here are some major findings that I found for those types, uh, type of educational task. Uh, for individual assessment, uh, generally speaking, the students don't feel that is much helpful, especially compared with traditional tools. Um, so they, they indicate that search engine would be enough. And also they have notes in the assessment questions based on the slides that I teach. So they have knows their own knowledge and search engine. They feel like there's not much need for um, talking with a chatbot. Um, and also for the question types, if I, they, most of them use um, chat GP to help with multiple choice and true and false questions rather than filling blank questions. So it's probably because um, I have a question that answer uh, that asks what is a prompt that you use uh, to help you with the questions, and most of them just copy and paste the question uh, to the chatbot interface, the ChatGPT interface. So maybe multiple choice and true and false is easier to ask. Um, is possible, and also most of them only use. Uh, try GPT once and they do not make several attempts and trying to gain more information um, and compare the results that they got and decided on one that they adopted. I think it's probably because this is a time limited assessment and they don't have enough time to to do like further exploration. Um, most of the students indicate that um, ChatGPT, the answer that ChatGPT gave is correct, even if the ChatGPT don't take my class. Uh, so that it also gave correct answers, but they do not want to make further attempts. Just take whatever um, the ChatGPT gives. Uh, for group project proposal write-up, um, they indicated that the most frequently used uh, services was brainstorming ideas and gain feedback for the draft, whatever draft they already have. Um, they also use ChatGPT to decide on the research method they use. So if they use a survey method, decide on what kind of sampling I should use and what kind of participant I should target based on my specific study context. Um, and also they, they use ChatGPT to revise um, questionnaire uh, this is probably because the majority of my students are non-native speakers. They're trying to frame the question in a way that is clearly, um, that is clear and understandable. Um, another interesting findings for proposal write-up is that uh, for groups that are used to uh, customize ChatGPT answers will customize everything that they got. So, uh, if it's generating ideas or getting feedback, they don't take it um, directly what the ChatGPT gives offers. But for groups that um, 
tend to take directly what ChatGPT offers, will take everything directly. Um, it's probably, I do explore this a little bit, but don't find a very good answers for that. And um, they don't have a clear, um, they don't have a significant difference in terms of their locus of, con locus of control and need for combination. And they don't have very much difference on their uh, academic performance. I think it's probably because there may be some group leaders in that groups that tend to fact check everything. So that makes that group like revised and customize everything that ChatGPT gave. And for groups that do not, they don't have a such a person in the group that uh, fulfill that rules. Um, group project data analysis, they used ChatGPT for um, analyze descriptive statistics like mean, median, mode, how should I calculate that in SPSS? And how should I uh, draw a histogram of the distribution of my samples? Um, and also, when I got the statistic output, how should I report in a professional academic way in my presentation? Um, so they said um, ChatGPT really helped them a lot in the basic statistic analysis, um, but it if in terms of a more complicated one, like regression um, and even t-test, they feel like it's not much helpful. Um, it could be due to their limited understanding of, of the statistic itself, but they also indicate that ChatGPT do not um, understand this, their study contact enough so that the further explanation they gave are just adding more irrelevant information or give alternative approaches rather than just um, addresses a specific question that they have. Next slide, please. So those are some suggestions that I think um, I could give for educators and learners based on my study findings. Um, so what works is group collaboration and brainstorming definitely works. So if you want to leverage ChatGPT to enhance your students' learning experiences, considering use ChatGPT in this aspect. And also uh, for the survey design um, and basic data analysis. But if it comes to a more complicated models, a really limited in its ability to provide further explanation on your study context or your model. Um, and also it's not that helpful for information recall questions, testing on the course content. Uh, students find that class notes and search engine are enough for them to help with um, answer the questions. And some suggestions for the educators, if you do not wish your students to use ChatGPT in quizzes or assessment, um, you could consider a form as a question in a filling blank ways instead of multiple choice or true and false. And also, um, because most students just copy and paste the question prompt, um, so you could consider prevent students from copying directly, maybe upload a screenshot of the question instead of typing in the um, quizzes systems. Um, but also, um, you could consider uh, using ChatGPT for brainstorming and group collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I definitely feel like group, uh, group collaboration need further exploration. They're much more rich social dynamic within it. Um, and the last, but I think the most important thing is um, to really report everything that you use. It's the thing that I've done in my class. Uh, I made it clear in my course policy that if you uh, report everything, it's, it won't count for plagiarism. Um, and also students expected you to give a clear guideline for what task can use ChatGPT and what task can't. And that should be made really clear. Um, that's uh, all about my finding that I found. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dongfeng. So I'm going to turn the Q&A over to Cindy. Thanks. 
And if you, everyone will just give me one second, I'm going to pin our speakers so that you can see them very clearly as they respond to the questions. And again, just a reminder, everyone, go ahead and submit your questions for this Q&A portion. And if you see questions that you think we should definitely be asking, be sure to hit that like button so that they get filtered up to the top. Um, I'm going to go back in our Q&A block and ask um, Sarah Madsen Hardy's question for Kevin uh, so everyone can hear the response. But Sarah's question is, do you have access to the chats with this bot or do you require students to share them? Uh, yeah, I do have access. Um, it wasn't a problem the first semester that we ran it, uh, having any sort of like bad behavior. Uh, but this semester with the attempts to sort of stop uh, an answers when there, there's too um, uh, sort of uh, verbose, uh, the students have started to kind of like spam uh, requests. And um, that's the kind of behavior that like, you know, we, we want to uh, discourage and want to sort of like know who's doing it. Um, so there's a little bit of kind of like tracking misuse there. Uh, and we also like log everything for research purposes um, to sort of make sure that questions are being helpful, like identify what kind of common sort of like um, uh, issues there are there. Um, and um, we uh, tell students uh, when they sign up that, you know, they may be logged, we may be sort of doing A-B tests, like this is a research environment. Um, students seem generally okay with that. I haven't sort of encountered any students who are sort of saying like that they didn't like the conditions. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move on next to Emily's question. Um, again, for Kevin, but I will start asking questions for all of our, our participants. So don't worry, Amber and Dong Peng. Um, but the next one for Kevin. So presumably Kevin created the chat, uh, the GPT-4 tool that is used for homework help. How could someone who doesn't know Python programming set up a similar GPT tool for a non-data science course? And, and actually I'll chime in. Anybody could chime into this question if you feel like you have some thoughts on this topic too. Um, yeah, so like uh, getting the exact like way that it works going um, would require either Python or for me to kind of like make a little package that would do, you know, some of the, the stuff uh, easily. So like there's, even though it's very little that it's doing, um, there's still the, like it has encrypted like versions of the homework files um, that it will read from uh, in order to sort of inject the the homework answers without showing them to the students and and this kind of thing. So like the full thing would be difficult to kind of emulate um, with just uh, you know no no Python. Uh, but I think there are interesting things you can do in this spirit that you can do without the full package. Um, you could make assignments where like um, the students ask things of uh, ChatGPT, but but you say like. But you have to include before everything you say this prefix, like you know, please, you know, answer in the in the following sort of like you know way that's more conducive to this uh, homework assignment, and then sort of like require them to sort of like submit the transcript that shows this was the way in which the, the assignment happened. That's like in the spirit of um, uh, what I've done. Um, the only the only issue is that like the pot might not be sweetened enough for the students to sort of use it appropriately. Um, I feel like the encrypted homework solutions are a real like draw for the students to use uh, our system instead of um, sort of, you know, ChatGPT. But this idea of like, uh, you control some of the instruction that goes to ChatGPT, I think that's emulatable without any Python. Thanks. Amber or Dungpeng, do you have any thoughts on this topic? Okay, just wanted to open it up for you. Okay, so our next question um, to all participants, do you have any hopes or plans for new ways to use AI in your courses beyond these tools? And we can start with Amber or Dong Peng. Okay, I'm just going to answer in my class. So I draw a line between personal interests and what I would choose to use in my classrooms because I personally, I like to test the new tools, right? So I would use the graphic design AI tools. I would have been playing with the new video making tools. However, I don't think when considering whether to use them in the classroom, I have to consider like the accessibility for all students for one and two, whether they actually would add more, what it adds can kind of justify the effort students need to put in to learn to use the tools and also the time and effort from the teacher and from the students. 
So I don't plan to use those tools in my classes, but I do, I'm staying open when the new uses or new tools come up. So open, but not necessarily planning for new tools, if that makes sense. So um, my students indicate, and uh, it's also something that Amber said in your presentation, my students also indicate they hope to have uh, more the AI to have more contextual understanding of the questions. Um, so when when they when it comes to help them with a group project and data analysis, they feel like it's not very targeted on their questions and on their project. Uh, they hope they have updated database, especially on the assessment that are assessment questions that I have for them. Um, but I feel like, um, I feel like, um, first, I feel like it's not very uh, ideal. Um, just like, um, students, um, you can't expect the AI technology to do everything for you. And the main goal is still to learn by yourself. And, um, and I feel like the already current version of the AI have already helped um, many aspects and can be a helpful assistive tools. Um, yeah, that's my understanding. And Kevin, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, so um, I would reiterate that my like main next step in making stuff for students would be the practice problems uh, kind of generator, which I imagine is being something that could kind of like also tailor itself to student interest. So the student could say like, I want a baseball problem. It's like, all right, we're going to, you know, code something up about baseball. Um, I think that'd be, you know, pretty uh, exciting. A different tool that I didn't mention in the talk is um, analyzing logs for common um, student misunderstandings. Uh, I've done a little bit of work in that uh, domain as well. So we have all these you know, giant logs and I'd like to summarize them as the instructor and sort of know what students are having trouble with. Um, so far, um, the work in, th in that vein is like kind of dodgy. It's not that great at summarizing um, in a way that I would find really helpful. And it also takes a lot of queries because it, it ha you have to sort of like ask what the theme was of every single interaction that the students made. So that's like, it's also expensive to do, um, but that's, you know, something uh, that, I've been experimenting with. Um, for other class content, um, I uh, the current moment in generative AI is that it produces like a lot of what you want, but it's not necessarily that good. Um, and I feel like I'm a, a <laughs> I feel like I'm a good educator. I feel like I can sort of produce you know better questions than uh, ChatGPT, um, better test questions, better like lecture content. So you know that I, I sort of still have them doing myself. But when it comes to practice problems, um, you know these things where uh, they just want more of it, then uh, it makes sense to use the AI. Thank you. Um, our next question is, have your students been largely positive in their feedback with these tools, or have they shared any larger concerns about using these tools in your courses? I feel like um, they're positive. Um, but the help is limited. So we can only help a limited um, aspect of the task that they're working on, but it's helpful. Um, concerns, um, little students express their concerns, but I feel like it should be the researcher's responsibility. Like researchers like me's responsibility to regulate um, is also, can also tackle on the next question on the department uh, on the yeah um, department and university plans. Um, so sorry, jumping the question a little bit. Uh, my my department's really supportive of my decision. I communicate with the deans. Um, I feel like it's the it's at the exploration stage, and we can ex uh, we only after exploring the scenarios so that we can make policy to regulate that and it's something that i want to achieve in my dissertation um, to really have a policy that can uh, regulate the use and make people benefit from the power of ai machines and technologies instead of being harmed by it and i definitely feel like 
uh, AI could empower humans um, is something that we need to use uh, and we need to learn to use it in an ethical way. Also to add to that question, also about the department or university support, when it's like largely depends on which department and my department is also very supportive. Actually, we have the two language departments, the world languages and Roman studies. We have a several, well, about 10, 20, I think, teachers are actually in one group with gathered centers and funded by a Shipley Center that we would meet monthly to discuss our uses of AI. So it's generally very supportive too. Kevin, what are your thoughts, either about sort of student responses to AI tech, positive, negative, or uh, moving ahead with the next question? Thank you, Dongpeng. Uh, thinking about the support of your department or even the university at large um, in terms of incorporating AI in your courses. Um, yeah, the, the department one is is the easier one. Um, definitely, um, Azure and CDS has been like full speed ahead on trying to be ahead of the generative AI uh, stuff. Um, and uh, I think he's really excited about the work and it's, it's just been 100% like supportive. Um, for the students, uh, it's a really interesting mix of um, attitudes among the students. I think there's definitely a, a strand of student who's like, doesn't use generative AI, also has heard that it is immoral to use <laughs> generative AI <laughs> just across the board. And then is unhappy that other people are using generative AI. Um, and so like the responses from uh, the students who have used the tutor system have generally been like either positive or just kind of, you know, neutral, like, uh, I'm not sure if it, you know, actually really helped, but it was kind of interesting. Um, and then like, uh, you know, in my end of semester survey that included students who did not use the tutor, I would get, you know, some comments from students who didn't use the tutor. They were like, there is no learning, you know, <laughs> like just uh, that, that, that thing rots people's brains. Uh, and so um, I think that this uh, conversation is still playing out among students and um, generative AI is often spoken of as a single thing. Um, and it's true that a lot of generative AI has like sort of like you know, commonalities across all of it. But um, as a result, you can get kind of students having, uh, you know, mindsets that it's sort of good or bad based on, you know, particular contexts. Um, and I do also think I see uh, evidence of students frankly not learning as well because they have relied on uh, generative AI. This is just my kind of general feeling from like, you know, looking at the logs where I do sometimes see students like just kind of like trying to sort of hit the candy machine, hoping that something will sort of like pop out. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just other sort of like seeing students turn in like work that uh, is, you know, clearly ChatGPT generated, um, where it wouldn't be our tutor, but like, you know, we get this. Um, and, um, and so that's why I think like, it's important to have those uh, in class paper and pencil, no external resources, um, uh, kinds of evaluations. Uh, so that we can say like, you can treat this stuff however you want, but at the end of the day, if you, you know, haven't learned the material, then it, it's going to show on the, on the exam. Um, so I'm like very bullish on them as a you know, instructional environment, but also, uh, kind of, um, not at all bullish on, uh, courses that switch entirely to like having evaluation be predicated entirely on generative AI, uh, creations. Great, thank you. And I think that leads into our last question. Um, so I guess for Amber and Dong Peng, are you guys also seeing students beginning to rely too heavily on Gen AI tools, um, like some worry, or that they are generally being responsible with their use of these tools? What are you guys seeing with students? Okay, I have to go, so I have to jump in first. So um, my I take a very cautious approach about it because especially because I teach language. So if students, for instance, they need to write an essay, they can easily just type some really basic keywords or just the topic of the essay and the chat GPT will give them the whole composition, right? So the good thing is it's very easy to catch because the, the composition is always beyond my current student's level. And I would sit down with the student, okay, you know it, I know it, I know you use this tool for it. And I usually don't go with like 
a punishment kind of stance for that. I usually, and I'm also lucky that I'm teaching Chinese because students have the choice to, to choose any language. If they choose Chinese, they want to learn it because it's the it's one of the hardest to learn language for them. So they actually want to learn it so that every time after we sit down and see, well, okay, this doesn't really help you to learn how to express yourself in the language yourself because the, the language doesn't really come from you. They pretty much stop using it after that. So I think having that one-on-one -on -one with students does help me. And I just want to chime in real quick. Thank you, Amber and Kevin. I know both of you need to run off to class real quick. So thank you for your participation in today's session. And Dong Peng will wrap up our Q&A. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so I I definitely agree with everything being said. I actually find out my students don't rely on the ChatGP that much, especially in the individual assessment. Um, so before my study, I expect them will like check everything, um, use every questions for with ChatGPT to help them in the quizzes. But it turned out that um, they don't use that that much. And the the pro the purpose for using ChatGPT is just to verify the answers they already have. So they already learned the content. Um, they already have an answer. It's just for checking purpose. So I think it's a is a good sign, actually. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dong Peng. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Deb Breen and Sam, if you want to pull up our concluding slide. Thank you. So thank you folks for staying and thanks so much for our speakers. And I'm sorry they're not all here, um, but they have, uh, you know, um, Amber and Kevin have gone off to class and thank you so much, Dong Peng, as well. Um, I think this was a great session just to sort of hear about some of the playfulness in these approaches, as well as the scaffolding, the effort of the student learning. And then as the questions kind of brought out at the end, um, just thinking about the ethical framework, as well as the need for more research into how students are using um, generative AI. So thanks so much. We have um, some uh, thanks so much to our speakers and for our audience. Uh, we have some more events coming up, so I've posted those in the chat. And we look forward to seeing you um, at any of any and all of those events. And um, particularly, you know, Lightning Talk is coming up on creativity and innovation. And uh, AI Collab, where you get a chance to work with uh, uh, Lisa Burgess, our CTL's Assistant Director, on um, experimenting in a hands-on session and then faculty forum, which is an opportunity to hear from lots of faculty, lots of colleagues about work that they're doing across many of their educational enterprises. Thanks so much, folks. We look forward to seeing you again.